It's my pleasure now to introduce David Daniele. David is a senior advisor with responsible technology teams at the Omid Yard Network. And David, please correct me if I'm mispronouncing that. Prior to joining the Omid Yard Network, David served as the deputy legal director with the Southern Poverty Law Center with a special focus overseeing the LGBTQ rights and special litigation practice group. David has served as a special counsel with the antitrust division of the US Department of Justice. And we are thrilled to have him here speaking with us today. David, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Seth. Thank you to the other organizers and Tom and Lena. It's wonderful seeing you again. Um, I was co-counsel in the Jonah case, and so all of these people are dear to me and will remain close friends and confidants for the rest of my life. Um, I wanted to pick up from Tom's observation that uh, battling conversion therapy from the legal standpoint often requires trying to figure out if there already are pre-existing laws regulations or standards that the people who are engaged in it are violating. Uh, and I wanted to take us back to 2010, 2011. Um, many of you may know that in 2009, the American Psychological Association released its landmark uh, study and uh, literature review of pre-existing writing about conversion therapy. And that was really the first time that one of the major psychological organizations had taken an historic look at efforts to change sexual orientation. Uh, and with the release of their report and their recommendations that concluded essentially that there was no evidence that conversion therapy worked and significant reason to think that it could cause significant harms, that launched, I think, renewed efforts in the advocacy community to think about ways to try to help people who'd undergone conversion therapy and try to end the practice. Uh, I was involved in some of those very early stages. I was in private practice, but I was working with the National Center for Lesbian Rights. And this is a little bit of a vignette to tell you how sometimes history can take a little bit of a turn that uh, ends up being very consequential. I was working with the National Center for Lesbian Rights thinking about a variety of ways to stand up for people who had survived conversion therapy and ended. Uh, and many of our ideas were very similar to what ended up taking shape in the Jonah case, um, thinking about consumer fraud, thinking about whether um, professional therapists were violating their own obligations to their clients. But in the midst of that, a uh, California legislator by the name of Ted Lieu, who now is in the House of Representatives, saw a show on CNN about something that was called the Sissy Experiment at UCLA, which was an historical effort to try to see if forcing young people to conform to gender norms could forestall the development of homosexuality. Uh, he watched that show and decided there ought to be a law. And so he started drafting a law that would have banned conversion therapy in California. That then became the focus of a lot of the advocacy efforts to ensure that that law, A, was something that we'd be able to defend in court against constitutional challenges, and B, could gather the support of the professional community as well as the survivor community. Um, that was obviously a very important step, but at the same time, it did detract us from pursuing some other theories that had we taken might have led to slightly different, I think, direction for this movement. So I just throw that out there to kind of emphasize the importance of the work that Seth is doing in thinking about the history uh, and recognizing the role of individuals and happenstance and the unpredictable. Um, many of you know that that effort to enact statutes has progressed apace uh, with uh, a bit of a, um, I would say, accelerated pace in the last five years. At last count, there are 20 states in the District of Columbia that have laws that prohibit licensed mental health professionals from engaging in conversion therapy with youth. Uh, and similarly, approximately 80 local governments have enacted similar bans. At the same time, however, I think a lot of people who have been involved in this movement, including many of the survivors who helped organize this conference, have come to the view that in some ways those bans are empty vessels, 
uh, to our knowledge, notwithstanding the fact that there are a hundred or so bans, uh, I am not aware of a single effort to enforce those bans. The structure of those bans generally declares that the provision of conversion therapy to minors constitutes what's called unprofessional conduct, which can give rise to a basis for pro professional um, licensure revoker, revoke, <laughs> revocal, revocal, that's not even a word, revoking or some other kind of disciplinary effort from the bodies within a state that uh, are in charge of licensing professionals. This is number one, a fairly limited remedy. Uh, and second, as I said, to our knowledge, none of these statutes or ordinances has been invoked in that way. And so the question is, what else can be done? What can people who are invested in the effort to eradicate conversion therapy do? Uh, and I want to be mindful of time. So what I'd like to do is just run through a few ideas to get people's brains spinning and thinking. Um, some of these are the kinds of things that require lawyers because they involve court fights. But some of them are advocacy efforts that I think non-lawyers can engage in. Uh, and I think that's especially important given that the focus of this conference is on survivors, not on, as I think, Michael, you turned some of us professional advocates. So I'd like to break the categories into two. The first category are efforts uh, that would necessarily involve lawyers to bring justice for people who have victim, been victimized or have survived conversion therapy. The second category is gonna be advocacy efforts that don't necessarily involve courts or lawyers. So again, because I wanna leave time for questions, why don't I just start down this list so we can see if this gets any of anyone's thinking caps kind of excited and flying off their heads. Um, so the first idea is uh, the invocation of what's called nuisance law. We oftentimes think of public nuisances, for example, as smelly buildings or places that have been abandoned and are uh, locations where drug deals happen. But nuisance has been used in a variety of settings, uh, even including settings such as efforts to stop the uh, sale of uh, guns in dangerous communities. Uh, California, for example, defines a nuisance as anything which is injurious to health. It is my view that a location, whether it be um, a, a conversion therapy operator or even a licensed provider's office, could be deemed a thing which is injurious to health. Uh, and there are a variety of ways in which the law can deal with that. One way is to term that what's called a public nuisance, which is something that affects the health of the community. Uh, again, I think it's not difficult to say that someplace like Jonah, which is uh, preying on hundreds and hundreds of young people, is injurious to the health of the community. And generally, the law allows anyone who has been specially harmed by that unhealthy conduct to bring an action for public nuisance. Um, I love the messaging of this. I love the idea that uh, it would allow labeling a business as something that is dangerous to the community. Uh, and I think it's a way for individuals to bring an action that has a broad remedy that would be protective of people in the future because the general remedy for a nuisance is what's called abatement. You shut it down just like the goal of, of the Jonah lawsuit was to shut down Jonah, a nuisance lawsuit could be used to shut down an operator. Uh, the next uh, action I wanna describe is malpractice. We're all familiar with the fact that people can bring malpractice claims against, for example, surgeons if they leave a sponge inside an open wound. Well, malpractice claims also can be brought against licensed professionals. Generally, the standard is that licensed professionals, whether they be psychiatrists, whether they be psychologists, or whether they be um, licensed marriage and family counselors, uh, the standard is that they must comply with standards of care. Now, especially if they are um, operating in a state that has a prohibition, 
it is easy to make the argument that if you nonetheless engage in something that looks like conversion therapy, that that is a variation from the standard of care. And if you've been damaged, then that individual would have a right to try to sue that counselor and seek damages. Um, but it's not just if they violate the standard of care. It also would include cases in which the licensed professional does not obtain what's called informed consent, meaning a full disclosure of the risks and benefits of the procedure. Uh, and I will say that many ethical codes that govern licensed mental health professionals require that the provider disclose if he or she intends to use a method that is not backed by data uh, and has not been proven or has not gained credence in the mental health profession. All of those things describe conversion therapy, obviously, to a T. One of the challenges we face, though, is that oftentimes conversion therapy is provided by people who are not licensed. They are not psychiatrists. They are not psychologists. Oftentimes, as uh, Michael and others, including Tom, have adverted to, they are provided by either life coaches or people from religious communities who claim that they are not engaged in the provision of mental health services. Well, uh, one option here would be to sue those people for what's called intentional infliction of emotional distress. This is, as the lawyers on the call will know, a common law, what's called tort, which can be brought if someone engages in intentional or reckless conduct that is extreme or outrageous and that causes mental distress. Now, what's important here is that the thing that must be intentional or reckless is the conduct. There generally is no requirement that the person providing the therapy or the treatment intend to cause the mental distress. What is required is that the provider intend or recklessly do what he or she did if that ends up causing the mental distress. I think Tom described the difficulty in getting into the minds of people in the context of litigation. The nice thing about this claim is that no such mind reading is required. If someone has done something that is uh, outrageous or extreme, such as the kinds of things that Lena described in her description of the kind of conduct that the plaintiffs in the Jonah lawsuit endured, that seems to me to be at the core of intentional infliction of emotional distress. Now, of course, if it's a religious provider who is engaged in this kind of conduct, we could expect some sort of a religious freedom defense. Um, but I think that this should be tested uh, and I'm eager to provide whatever I can <laughs> to support whoever is brave enough to bring such a claim. I think we're at a stage in our knowledge about um, conversion therapy, its dangers, that it would be quite easy to describe the kind of thing that goes on in these efforts as both extreme and outrageous. Um, the last uh, method I wanted to describe that can be used to help people who either are in the midst of um, experiencing conversion therapy or are under a threat of being sent to conversion therapy involves the family law. Um, quite recently, there is a matter that is under seal, and so I have to be careful about not revealing specifics, that involved a young man. He was a minor. Uh, he revealed to his father that he was gay. His father put him into, uh, I guess I'll call it a boarding school, um, and was about to transfer him to a specific religious school that has a horrible reputation of both abuse, uh, physical as well as mental, and specifically the practice of conversion therapy. Um, the response to this uh, on behalf of a concerned aunt and uncle was to bring uh, an emergency petition in the family court for custody on the grounds that the father's threat to place the child into this uh, conversion therapy camp was uh, abusive and posed a threat to the, to the health and, and safety of the child. Um, that's the kind of thing that requires extremely quick work. Uh, it is a rather extreme remedy. 
but I throw that out there because I think a lot of us, sometimes we hear about situations and we feel helpless, but I just want people to know that it doesn't have to be. Uh, and that is now an example of a way to try to prevent harm that has been proven successful in some of our courts. Uh, and I really hope that more people will be using it. So from there, I want to switch to just touching upon a few legislative or policy advocacy options other than simply enacting these bans on the provision of conversion therapy by licensed um, mental health professionals. Uh, the first has to do with undertaking efforts to strengthening the licensing requirements for all sorts of state licensed businesses that interact with young people. Um, so, for example, that could include daycare centers, that could include after school providers, that could um, include some of these boarding schools, including religious schools. Uh, I'll give you an example of a loophole that we helped close in Alabama that we think prevented a lot of uh, potentially very dangerous abuse of children. Alabama had a regulatory scheme for boarding schools that literally exempted religious affiliated boarding schools from the vast majority of regulations, including those that were intended to make certain that uh, people who provided, for example, mental health care were licensed by the state to do so. That led to the proliferation of a number of schools, including one that got a lot of press around three or four years ago for engaging in conversion therapy um, in a way that really was abusive. The response to that was to close that legislative loophole. And once that legislative loophole was closed, this school no longer could operate. Uh, it may have popped up in another state, but that does not mean that that was an unsuccessful effort. So legislative efforts to close loopholes for any kind of entity that has any kind of either permanent or temporary custody or care of children. Uh, another, which is a version of the kind of activity that's gone on in the states and cities and counties around the country, are declarations that simply state a local government's view about conversion therapy. Um, a declaration is something that a, a county or a city does all the time. They might declare that something is national or I'm sorry, you know, poodle day in the city of Los Angeles, or they might declare that February is the month for popsicles in Milwaukee. I mean, who knows? But the bottom line is that the Supreme Court of the United States has confirmed that local governments have speech rights. So they are free to espouse their views about things, even when those things are controversial. We have used this in a number of um, circumstances in which it was possible that there could be a constitutional challenge to a ban. And to the extent that a declaration still gives locally uh, elected officials an opportunity to take a stand, um, that can help make young people feel safe in those communities. It can help educate parents and it can put practitioners on notice that enforcers of a variety of kinds of laws uh, are looking out and making certain that no harm is done to young people. Uh, the third, and then I'll stop, is uh, the opportunity to ensure that teaching about conversion therapy and its dangers makes its way into professional curricula, both at medical schools, PhD programs, professional schools that um, uh, provide backgrounds for people who want to become licensed as therapists. This is something that I think any of us can do. Many people on this call probably have connections to the mental health field or the medical field. All of us can go to our uh, alma maters and ask whether this topic is a part of the curricula. We also can go to licensing boards uh, if we have licenses from various boards and see if there are ways to make certain that the kinds of requirements that are imposed involve a complete and fair sex education that includes teaching about conversion therapy efforts uh, and even on licensing exams. So these are the sorts of soft advocacy tools that don't involve even going to elected officials, 
that I think many people on this call probably can engage in starting tomorrow. So I've used up my time. I'm going to stop. I will apologize. I have a hard stop at exactly noon for a different call, but uh, I'll stay on as long as I can. I'm going to jump back on later in the afternoon as well.